All right, this is episode E of Rakaia 1899, and I'm standing on a single line of railway. And back in the shoestring days, the single line of railway was kept safe in theory by a combination of what was called running by book and the rules and regulations. Running by book also made promises with respect to a train having the right to occupy any stretch of line or to enter or run through any given station. If we look at the 1899 version of running by book, the front of the train out on the line was protected by the fact that the working timetable mandated crossing points for every given train. And for instance, that relates to the 11th of March 1899, is that on any given Saturday, train number 21 South from Christchurch to Ashburton was mandated to cross the Up Express at Chertsey. And as far as efficiency goes, there's a flaw in working by book. And that flaw is that if for any reason 21 South is running late, then the Express will have to sit and wait at Chertsey for it to show up, before it could get an open line and proceed safely to Christchurch. Trains were protected from the rear by the incorporation of a time barrier into the working timetable. That time barrier was either 10 or 15 minutes, depending on which regulation was followed on any given occasion. An easy way to look at the flaws in the 1899 system of train management is to look at our more modern system. And last month I spent a rainy afternoon at Waterloo watching trains trigger the four sequences of coloured light signals. The way that system works is that when a train passes any given signal, it turns it from green to red. At that point, the train is protected from any subsequent trains because they are bound to stop at the red signal. When our protected train gets to the next signal in the sequence, that too is triggered to red, so now the train is doubly protected. When it gets to the third signal, the first signal turns to amber. Amber, unlike traffic lights, is not an invitation for a driver to gun the gap and hope for the best. What amber signifies is that right now the next signal in the sequence is at red, and in crossing an amber signal, a driver must be prepared to stop at the next signal if it is displaying red when he or she gets to it. When the protected train crosses the fourth signal in the sequence, the first goes to green. So the sequence of protection is red, red, amber, green. And on the afternoon that I stood in the rain at Waterloo watching this sequence, it took about a minute and a half to cycle through those four signals. And the thing about the safety system at Waterloo is that it creates a buffer in time, being the minute and a half, as well as in physical distance. There's some stories that Frank Roberts tells in his book Vintage Steam, and those stories tend to illustrate that the railway system got by as much on the vigilance of their staff as by what was required of those staff in the book and in the regulations. One of Frank's stories is about the afternoon when his train derailed a few miles short of Moronsville. With no way of communicating with the outside world, the guard actually walked to Moronsville to raise the alarm. Frank Roberts went forward with a red flag, which on the face of it shouldn't have been required because in theory, the derailed train should have been protected by the fact that any train traveling in an opposite direction would have a mandated crossing point with Frank's train. 
So the fact that Frank Roberts felt he needed to go forward suggests very strongly that faith in working by book was somewhat less than absolute. The train only had a three-man crew, so the driver stayed with the train and they found the likely looking passenger to proceed back along the track to protect the rear of the train. The reason why they needed to do that is that on that day there was an express running behind Frank's train. And as the passenger put it, he didn't think the express was going to stop because of the speed it came up to him at. Don't worry, said Frank, they just wanted to get to you as soon as they could. If efficiency is each train moving as scheduled, then inefficiency is any train sitting and waiting for whatever reason. And since trains did and still do run late for a multitude of reasons, the railway department came up with a means of promoting timeliness. And in a very Victorian approach, what they would do is they would fine the driver of any late running train the equivalent of a day's pay if his train ran late without reasonable explanation. But the department also had an unspoken policy of turning a blind eye to the maximum speed limits mandated in working by book, so that if a driver stretched the rule about the maximum allowable speed of his train in order to make up time, then that was fine, provided of course nothing went wrong in doing so. And since trains do run late for a multitude of reasons that even fines or blind eyes can't fix, the railway department came up with a process called line clear by wire. And as the name suggests, that process used the railway telegraph network to allow two station masters at two separate stations to coordinate an amendment to the mandated crossing point. So the example I used about the North Express waiting forlornly at Chertsey isn't quite correct because as I said back in episode C, Chertsey was on the wire. So in all likelihood, if 21 South was running late, line clear by wire would have been used to hold 21 South back at another station to allow the Express to proceed. At least that would have been the case on any normal night. But the 11th of March 1899 was not a normal night. There were two special trains out on the line. And that's the problem with working by book. Working by book is fine as far as it goes for scheduled trains. But special trains are extra the book. They are in fact shoehorned into the schedule by issuing the working notice that I discussed back in episode A. So if we look at the 11th of March 1899 and the special notice in question, it rewrote the timetable from 7.25 until 10.25 on that Saturday morning and then in the evening it rewrote the schedule again from 6.05 p.m until 8.45 p.m. when the second picnic train was due to arrive at Christchurch. If we look at the working notice for the down trip to Ashburton, we can see that the trains left Christchurch with a 15 minute safety barrier between them. By Templeton it was down to 10 minutes and that separation remained in place all the way through to Ashburton. But if we look at the fine print, we can see that on the southward run, there's train number 5 south, running 5 minutes in front of the first picnic train, and train number 7 south, running 10 minutes behind the second picnic train. So we now have 4 trains in the space of 25 minutes. And 4 trains in 25 minutes would be plenty of time running through Waterloo in 2021. But as Frank Roberts' story suggests, it wasn't plenty of time on the Shoestring Railway. Time buffers are, of course, about protecting the rear of any given train out on the line. 
and we know that the Rakaia collision did not happen to a train out on the line. It happened to a train standing at a station platform. But running by book was a key part of the environment within which Charles Henry Carter made his decisions. An environment where a driver might perhaps risk fast running rather than risk a day's pay. An environment where Charles Henry Carter would have been aware that his late departure from Ashburton could impinge on the timeliness of the express running behind him. The tension between what was required by the rules and what was promised by the book led to a tendency where drivers would whistle early and break late. And the reason why they tended to break late was because they didn't want to run the risk of consuming all of their timeliness and speed and momentum to find some clerk or porter belatedly running out onto the platform to display the expected green flag or green lamp. To bring all of that back to the protection of the first picnic train as it stood at Rakaia, we need to mention Mr May, the station master, and how he acted prudently in sending James O'Neill back down the track with his red lamp. But there's nothing to suggest that Harry Carter or Frank Mather on the footplate of U284 that night knew to be on the lookout for such a lamp in such a location. And it would be a long bow to draw to claim that they acted imprudently in not keeping a lookout. John May didn't on a whim send James O'Neill back down the line. And when Harry Carter whistled for down brakes, John May and Henry Curson, who was the guard on the first picnic train, didn't display the green to the first picnic train out of an abundance of caution. And Michael Gardner and William Highland, way up forward, didn't warm their cylinders and didn't open their sanders and didn't tell their firemen to keep a lookout for a green signal just in case. They acted as they did because across the collective experience of those six men, they would have witnessed similar events, similar risks being averted by fine margins because someone somewhere acted beyond what was required by the rules and attended to safety themselves. There's a phrase that was used in Cross at Rakaia, they were broken into the danger. So we go back to Charles Henry Carter and his mental steps and missteps that occurred in the environment where the book had long ago been outpaced by traffic demands and long ago outpaced by the power and speed of the locomotives hauling that traffic. Where on one particular evening, the tissue paper thin safety on the shoestring railway was pierced by some assumptions, a decision to make up for lost time, and a handful of quite simple mistakes of fact that combined that night to take the second picnic train into Rakaia and into the colony's worst railway disaster. All right, like, subscribe, enjoy. Don't enjoy, really up to you. I'm taking a break over the summer. Hopefully it'll be picnic weather. Cheers, see you in the new year.